Thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Witnesses, your full name is Scott Maxwell Wilson. Yes, it is. And your work address is level 10, 123 Eagle Street, Brisbane. Yes, that's correct. And you're presently the chair of the board of Electricity Supply Industry Superannuation Queensland Limited, the trustee of the Energy Superfund. Yes. And you've been a director of this company since 2011. Correct. In front of you, on your left, do you have a summons addressed to you by the Commission? I do. Dated 31 July 2018? Uh, yes. I attend to that summons, Commissioner. The summons to Mr Wilson is Exhibit 5.130. Thank you. Mr Wilson, do you have next to you, I think on your left, a document headed Statement of Scott Maxwell Wilson, rubric 504? I do. Which is signed by you? Correct and which includes various exhibits referred to in that statement? Correct. And to the best of your knowledge, are your statements in that document true and correct? They are. I tend to that statement, Commissioner. The statement of Mr Wilson concerning rubric 5-04, exhibit 5.131. Thank you. And Mr Wilson, is the third document in front of you a document headed statement of Scott Maxwell Wilson, rubric 563, which is signed by you? Correct and which includes various exhibits referred to in that statement? Yes. To the best of your knowledge, are your statements in that document true and correct? They are. I attend to that statement, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 5.132 is the statement of Mr Wilson concerning rubric 5-63. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Wilson, my name's Albert Donnelly. I'm one of the council assisting the Commission. Good afternoon. You indicated that you're the chair of the trustee, is that correct? Correct. And that entity is the, uh, the trustee, that is Electricity Supply Superannuation Queensland Limited is the trustee of Energy Super? Yes. And you've been the chair, have you not, since January of this year? This year, that's correct. Um, but in fact, as you said in, a, in answer to my learned friend, you've been a director since 2011? I have. And you were the deputy chair between December 2014 and December 2017? Correct. And just for completeness in terms of your current roles on the board of the trustee, I understand you're presently a member of the Governance Remuneration and Nomination Committee. I am. And also the Insurance and Claims Committee. I am. So from your experience on the board over the past seven years, mm -hmm. you're able to assist the Commission by explaining the nature of the duties of a trustee. I can. And how those duties have been complied with by Energy Super. Yes. And when a request was made of Energy Super for a person to give evidence, you were put forward as that person. Yes. Can you perhaps assist the Commissioner by explaining something about the history of the Energy Super Superannuation Fund? Okay, so the Energy Super um, Superannuation Fund has a long history. It's, uh, it's, there's two wings to the, to the fund, if, if I can explain it that way. We merged, we went through a successful merger in 2011. One of those wings uh, is based in the electricity generation, distribution and supply sectors. And that's been going for a very many years. I actually was a member of that fund when I first started work in 1982 for a very short time. Um, the other arm of our uh, energy super fund comes out of a, um, the electrical contracting sector. And there was a, a precursor fund to our fund now called SPEC, Superannuation Plan for Electrical Contract Area either work in generation, supply, or they could also work in uh, the electrical contracting, construction, pro those two will benefit to I, I sorry and To the fund.
a member appointment? Well, it, we have uh, trustees who are appointed um, either through an employer sponsor or an employer appointed or a uh, member appointed and they're appointed through either the Electrical Trades Union or the Australian Services Union or the QSU, the Queensland Services Union, as a representative of the members of the uh, fund. Am I right that there's two that are nominated by the ETU, is that correct? By the... Two that are nominated by the ETU. Ah, yeah, two by the ETU. Yeah, is the ETU just to assist? Is the ETU an overarching name for various different unions? Or no, no, no. The Electrical Trades Union, Queensland Northern Territory branch, is the nominating body. So that's a standalone state registered union. I see. Uh, uh, and a state branch of the state federal branch. body. Yes, correct. Yeah, but uh, the relevant body is the state branch. Yes, the yeah. relevant body is the appointing body is the state branch. State branch. Yeah. yeah, it's not a national appointment. No. I understand that, and in fact, we'll come to I think some other bodies shortly. Can you explain to me if, if, or how the um, communications electri electrical and plumbing union fits in? Okay, the that's the short name. The long names goes on for quite some time, communication, electrical, plumbing, postal, et cetera, et cetera. That is a, uh, a federal registered union, uh, which has a communications branch, an electrical branch, and a plumbing branch. And in the postal, there's postal and uh, um, telecommunications services. So the CEPU is a, a, a national body, um, which is a national union made up of those three separate branches. During the 1980s, there was a, a move to amalgamate um, a lot of smaller unions into bigger um, uh, bigger unions, which we're still seeing today, and the CEPU is a result of that. So there's a national uh, registra registration called the CEPU, which we are the electrical division. I understand that. Thank you for that clarification. So two, the constitution, as I understand it, provides that two uh, of the directors are nominated by the ETU. Correct. Um, and one by, if I can call it the QSU, uh, which yes. is the Australian Municipal Administrative Clerical and Services Union of Queensland. Yes, there's, um, there's a, a bit of a, a detail around that. The, uh, when the, the two funds joined in 2010-11, uh, to bring those two together, there was obviously um, QSU representatives on uh, the supply generation distribution side, but not on the electrical contracting project work mm. industry side of the precursor fund spec. So the ETU and the QSU uh, have a, um, a rotating um, a nomination process where there's uh, two from the QSU, two from the ETU, and then when the terms rotate, when they rotate, rotate out, I, I might need a document to explain it, but when the terms rotate out, it goes three back to one. So at this present point in time, there is one QSU, three And ETU. three ETU. Yeah. That's right. When and my term expires in 2020, it will go back to two ETU, two QSU. So can I understand then that at any one time there's four appointed by the unions in the way that you've described? Correct. Uh, and four by the employers. Correct. And that, and there is one independent director, is that correct? There is one independent director. And you yourself, I think you've said, were appointed in 2011 as a member representative. Correct. So there's various links between the trustee board itself and these various um, unions. Am I right that some, but not all of the directors the union appointed directors pay their director's fees to the union that they represent? Um, we pay <laughs> director's fees to uh, the director and then what they do is a, an arrangement between them and their sponsoring body. So for example, um, a director may choose, depending on the rules of their uh, union or the sponsoring body, uh, they may choose to pass those fees onto the uh, sponsoring body as a um, I suppose, a way of covering for the, the hours they spend doing the trustee work. 
the I lost opportunity hours. For example, I, I keep my director's fees. Mine don't go back to the electrical <coughs> trades union. Um, and in fact, this is set out, I think, in your statement at um, tab SW20 EYS.00.11.0001.1023. Um, you'll recall that in your evidence you referred to directors and executive officers' remuneration, do you recall? Uh, yes. Um, and it's quite small, perhaps if the top um, section for the year ended to 30 June 2017 can be um, blown up. And You'll see that there's various footnotes there for Mr. S David Smith, Mr. Peter Simpson, and Ms. Nisha Trail. Yes. Um, and they refer to, in the case of number one, the remuneration is paid to the Australian Services Union. Correct. And number two, the remuneration paid to the Communications Electrical Plumbing Union Electrical Division. Correct. So is that a matter for each of the directors, how they... Yes. Assign the, the money they receive for being a director. Uh, between the director and the sponsoring organisation. I see. And in your evidence, you've also indicated that Energy Super has agreements with, with various unions, is that correct? Uh, correct. And they deal with, or at least those that, to which you refer um, to as the union partners include um, the Electrical Trades Union Queensland and Northern Territory. Yes. The Communications Electrical Electric Electronic Energy Information Postal Plumbing and Allied Services Union of Australia. That's Correct. the one that you said had That's quite a long, long name. name. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> the second is the CEPU Tasmanian Division. Yes. And then the Services Union, which is um, the union we referred to before, the Australian Municipal Administrative Clerical and Services... All ..who were in land. That's it. And so they're known as the union partners, yes. are they, of Energy Super? And perhaps if I can ask that I show a sample of one of those. There's a sponsorship agreement with ETU Queensland and Northern Territory. That's it. Exhibit 1 to your second statement, which is EYS.0006.0001.1109. Yep. And that's the... If it's easier for you, Mr Wilson, you'll see that... Oh, okay. you've got It's also on the screen there, and I'll take you to the relevant page. This is the agreement with the ETU... Queensland and Northern Territory of last financial year, is that correct? Uh, yes. And there hasn't been one yet signed for this year? No. Uh, and if I you go... it's being uh, discussed, negotiated. Uh, yeah, I think your evidence is that it's still in the, yeah. the process of negotiation. And if you go to page... Sorry, if you go to the page um, quadruple one, which, Mr Wilson, it's now on the screen. Yeah, OK. Uh, do I understand it correctly that $63,800 is paid to the Electrical Trades Union pursuant to this agreement? Correct. And, and what's that for? You want to know what the... Yes, please. OK, okay the, um, the amount of money that is paid uh, pursuant to this agreement is a part of our marketing uh, spend, part of our marketing and interacting with members um, process. So for that um, amount mentioned, we, uh, and you can see there's a list of the uh, activities that take place just below that, um, uh, that, that, um, um, that first dot point. So there's uh, provision of energy supermarketing material, there's um, 
visits to major project sites to interact with members. There's attendance at conferences. Uh, we attend um, biennial delegates conferences. We attend industry conferences. Uh, we get in front of members at, a, at an enormous rate. Sorry, when you say we, what do you mean? Well, I'm talking about our business development people okay, at, at I the see. fund. I, I probably use that term incorrectly. Energy Super gets in front of a lot of members through this arrangement. Um, so who actually attends these events to which you're referring? We have uh, business development um, employees who go out and visit members on site. It's a quite common um, activity for them to interact with members on site, to talk to them about the benefits of uh, for example, combining multiple accounts if they have multiple accounts open, to looking at their insurance cover is it appropriate for the time, um, having a look at um, any of their contribution strategies, maybe talking to them about have they thought about you know, retirement plans. There might be an opportunity to direct them to some of the other services that we have. So and, it's, a, it's a direct marketing, it's um, an interactive approach to getting in front of members. I understand that. and. It must be mean, I, I just don't understand though. Who is it that does that though? Is it the, an ETU person that does that or is it an energy super person that does that? An energy super person will do it in conjunction with an ETU person. You can't get onto a major project. You can't just rock up to a Gladstone um, you know, site or a, 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 some sort of project out in the, you know, out in the uh, wilderness and say, I'm just here to talk about superannuation. You need to have that connection into the industry to be able to attend, to get in front of people. And that's the purpose for which Energy Super pays that money to the ETU, is it's that It's one right? of those, one of the purposes, yeah. To, to provide that. ease of access to get in front. And, and it's your view that that's in the best interest of members to ensure. Certainly, certainly. Um, and as I understand it, you have similar sponsorship agreements with the other three unions that I mentioned yeah. a moment ago. Yeah. And they're along, um, slightly different terms, but... It's, it depends on the location, depends on the, the type of... Uh, um, for example, we were looking to try and uh, expand, maybe grow some uh, membership in uh, Tasmania. So we approached uh, the Tasmanian market with a slightly different aspect. Um, it's a different, uh, different environment down there. What works in Queensland may not slightly work exactly the same way um, in Tasmania, for example. And that's the agreement that you entered into only a couple of months ago yeah. um, with the CEPU down in Tasmania, is that right? That's right. Um, so through this arrangement, we also get in front of members at conferences and delegates meetings and members meetings. We also attend conferences for, um, uh, you know, any number of occasions we, we get in front of. We have a, we gave statistics on the success of these um, activities. And one statistic I think is remarkable is that in, any, in, a, in a given year, we have about 18% of our membership interacts with us either face-to-face -face or takes some sort of action as a result of being involved in a, a thing like this. And, and the, the national average is about 1.5%. So it's a, it, it's a big payoff for a small investment. Uh, and can you explain to me why that interaction uh, and the retention of members or uh, the attraction of new members is in the interests of the members generally? Well, obviously, if we don't retain our membership, if we don't attract new membership, um, it's going to place pressure on the existing membership. So by attracting new membership and retention of existing membership, we grow our funds under management. And that's, that's a very important aspect of your roles? Of course it is, yeah. yeah, very uh, much so. So we, the, the growth in, in funds under management is very important because we, we get the scale efficiencies. We spoke about um, the directors before. It's your view, is it that the mix of directors is appropriate to discharge the duties of the trustee? Correct. Um, and leaving aside um, Ms Ma for a moment, um, who's an independent director, do I understand that once, appoint, once appointed a union nomination, uh, so the union nominates someone who then becomes a director, is that right? Correct. Can the uh, fund or the trustee reject the nomination? They certainly can. 
who gets the final say if push comes to shove. If somebody is proposing X be appointed and the existing board say no, X for whatever reason is not an appropriate person, who has the final word? The directors of the trustee. We can we can refuse someone under a, a you know a number of uh, reasons. You, perhaps we can explore that, and you can tell me why that's the case. Can I take you to the constitution, mm -hmm. um, which is at eys.0001.0001.0005. So this is the current constitution, is it, Mr Wilson? Um, yes. Can I take you first to page 0015 and to 14.5AE? Now, I understand this is consistent, and I'll have that blown up so it's easier for you. I understand this is consistent with your evidence before, that is, from 1 April 2014, ETU may select two member directors, QSU may select one member director, Correct. and then ETU and QSU may alt alternately select one member director on two year rotations with the initial rotation selected by the ETU. Correct. Now, just to assist the Commissioner on what you've just been asked, if you go back to 14.4B, which I was on the previous page, in fact, is on 0013. You'll see at the bottom there the provisions of Article 14.4b apply, subject to other provisions, which we don't need to deal with for the moment, from the changeover date. And you can assume, as I'm sure you know, that the changeover date is the 22nd of March 2011. And that would accord with your evidence before that was the date upon which the unions merged, was it not? Sorry, the funds merged? So you'll just have to oh, say... sorry. Yes, well, you'll just have to answer. Could you, could you repeat the that 20, The date that I had previously, th that I referred to as a changeover date, or this document refers to as a changeover date, is the 22nd of March 2011? Yes. And that accords correct. with the time that the merger that you referred to before occurred? Yes. So then if you go over the page, it says, person selected from time to time as a member director or employer director take office where selected to replace a director whose term of office is to expire on the expiry of that term of office or otherwise five business days after the date of receipt by the secretary. Mm -hmm. Now, that the constitution itself doesn't provide that the board can reject a um, nomination, does it? No, it does, in previous pages. So if you look at... Sorry, what was the answer, Mr Wilson? You said... I just didn't hear it. Oh, sorry, That's I, the problem. I said on a previous page, it yeah. indicates where a uh, director can be refused. Yes. Is that? You... Yeah. Okay. Problem of hearing you. That's all. <laughs> okay. My sorry. fault, not yours. Okay. Go on. And um, can you take me to that? Um, if you can, I have a hard copy. Uh, yes, you'll find it at SW one. That's the very first document in... So you might have oh. in your statement 504. Oh, OK. 504. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay, if you go to uh, page 11 of that yep. document. Yep, so it's just underneath where we were before. Um, G, any person may be selected, is that where you're... That's the one, yeah. 
Subject to the superannuation. Subject to the superannuation law and the eligibility criteria determined by the directors. Okay. So then if you go, so I assume that's a reference, is it not, to the board renewal policy and, uh, and the fit and proper policy, is that right? Um, it's also expanded at H. The incumbent directors may determine rules and procedures for appointment and removal of uh, member alternate directors. Yes, yeah, so that applies oh, to sorry. the alternate directors. Sorry, alternate directors. So then if I can take you to SW2, the board renewal policy. Yep. Uh, and that is EYS.0005.0001.0051. Correct. And you note there, well, this is a um, document that's prepared in accordance with an APRA prudential standard. You're familiar with those? Yes. Uh, and this is... Uh, prepared to meet the requirements of Prudential Standard SPS 510. Correct. And at point five on 0052, you note amongst uh, the, this document refers to, or has some background, 5.1, the trustee undertakes a regular review of the skills, knowledge and experience on the board and directors are required to undertake a minimum number of hours each year to meet their professional development. Do you see that? Correct. Yep, and I see if, that. And, uh, and the board composition and renewal process is reviewed on an annual basis, number two. Yes. Um, and also you note there the trustee takes the view that having regard to the complexities of the financial services and superannuation industry, uh, the development of expertise and knowledge of the industry and of the fund and the SESI group takes time. You see that? Yes. Now, at paragraph 10, there's other provisions which deal with nomination eligibility um, and there's a reference to fit and proper policy, which I'll take you to in a moment. But 10.1 provides the trustee maintains a skills matrix showing the relevant experience and diversity the board currently has and identifying gaps it looks to fill in order to effectively fulfil its strategic plan. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and does the trustee do that? Yes. And 10.2 provides that the trustee will engage with the sponsoring bodies. Now, I assume that's a reference to the unions and to, and to the employer bodies? Yes. Um, so that they remain aware of the fund's business and strategic plans and the skills and capabilities required in a nominated director to effectively oversee the implementation of that strategy. Do you see that? Yes. And then it, it provides the various things that the trustee engages with the sponsoring body about. Um, they are commitment to the industry super ethos, fit the identified skill needs of the board, meet the fund's identified skills, um, et cetera. Yes, I see that. Now, the last dot point there provides that um, there must be uh, compliance, I'm sorry, that including fulfilling the funds fit and proper policy. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And the fit and proper policy, um, which as I said, I'll take you to next, is EYS.0005.0001.0029. Yes. It provides for the appointment of directors at page 0033. Yes. And I think I asked you previously, but I think 8.1 summarises the position that directors are appointed by reference to the trustees constitution and the board's renewal policy, director nomination, appointment and removal. You see that? Yes, I do. And 8.4 provides that there'll be a governance, remuneration and nomination committee. That's the committee you're on, isn't it? Uh, yes. Um, and at 8.6, it says the trustee uses a fit, standard fit and proper questionnaire to assess a nominee, which will address the following matters. Yes. 
general personal information, current and past directorships, major shareholdings, education and qualifications, professional associations, professional experience, character matters, and the provision of consent to do various checks. Do you see that? Yes. So am I right that the trustee uses a fit and proper questionnaire to assess a nominee uh, for the purposes of complying with this policy? It's one of the things that we use. And, and in fact, I think you'll find at paragraph, sorry, at exhibit SW70, the one that was used for, for you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, SW71, which is EW, sorry, EYS.0011. Triple zero one dot zero seven eight nine. And is that the fit and proper questionnaire to which you referred? Um, it certainly looks like it. Uh, yes. And that sets out, amongst other things, um, on page um, zero seven nine three. Your Qualifications. Uh, yep. And at zero seven nine four, your professional associations. Yes. And that's. And. Also in your evidence, you referred to the one for Ms Christine Ma. Rather than stay on the detail of this, can I come out a, to a rather larger picture to two questions that are related and how you deal with them, uh, I leave to you, but if I put them together, uh, you'll see there are two aspects of it. How hard is it to administer it and how effective is it to administer not so much the fit and proper as the skills matrix, but skills matrix plus fit and proper uh, are two elements that go to um, application mm. at board member selection yep. time. Yep. Now, two questions. How hard, in your experience, is it to administer that? And related to that may be how effective do you think it is uh, in what you get out at the other end, as it were, of the process? OK, so am I answering your questions, Commissioner, or...? You always answer the Commissioner. OK, question. sorry, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> he can say that. OK. And if he doesn't, I do. OK. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's a process that we undertake to, uh, I suppose, um, meet a minimum requirement to, to become a, a director. What we've, uh, to, sorry, become a director of the trustee. What we see here is a, um, a, f a format of collecting some information. There's also the, no, I'm, I'm on the wrong path. I no, I, I, I'm the fit and proper stuff. You're OK. I, I can readily understand. You okay. want to know whether people are in bankruptcy, have got yeah. criminal histories and, and other such uh, things. That's easy. I can understand that. It's essential information. I'm not saying it's unimportant information. It's really the skill set. OK, the skill set. And the set. skill matrix. OK. But how hard is that to administer and really related to that is uh, how effective is it, okay. do you think, in generating uh, a result? I think I can answer it like this. The skills matrix um, is a tool that we use to look at our whole board and the collective skills on the board. So we approach this with a collective approach. So the board itself makes the decisions. If we have a director who is removing or retiring off the board or rotating off. Recently we had uh, an employer director, uh, Peter Scott, was moving on. So we engaged with 
the sponsoring organisation, told them the skill set that we wanted or we were seeking, because on our skills matrix, that was one place we were going to be a bit under. So we engaged early, we talked, Peter assisted in finding a replacement, and that replacement was uh, Mr. Man Man, who's come onto the board as the most recent director. That process takes place with whether it's an employer nominated director or uh, a, a, and a union nominated director. We engage, we, we talk to them about who we're after. Now, the skills of a director in our fund, obviously you need to have um, you know, skills on, or, or quickly gain those skills, but there's also the things that you need to uh, have an association with the industry, what we're about. Know what it's like to engage with members know what it's like to be in front of members. I'm so accountable to members. I see them every day. Mm. You need someone with that passion for the members of the fund. And I don't know how you capture that in a skills matrix. You know, it's it's, a, it's a, a gut feeling. And is the result effective? I believe so. I think it's very effective. And it's effective because we are a well-managed fund. We're performing well. We're retaining our membership. Our fund is growing year on year. It, there may be other more effective ways of doing it, but at this point in time, we find that it is a very effective way of maintaining our uh, level of skills and knowledge. It also it works hand in hand with a, um, uh, a skill development plan. Every director enters into a development plan with our education um, officer, and we work over that for the next period of time, over the, over the uh, 12 months and they will identify other skills that they might like to enhance or pick up. So I think it's a very effective tool and it works well. And do you think it yields good governance, adequate governance, uh, proper governance of the fund? I do, uh, I do. No holes there that you would point to? Um, currently we have probably a bit of a lack of uh, expertise in investments due to the, um, we lost our long-term in, in, uh, director. However, what we're doing to alleviate that is uh, we're looking for a specialist uh, person with investment knowledge to uh, fill in at the committee level, which we find a, a most efficient way to do that. You can bring people in to also upskill the directors as well. You can bring them in at the committee level and then uh, uh, when that job is completed, we should all be skilled up to that acceptable level. I've diverted you, Mr. Donnelly. Uh, you referred to so slightly. You referred to Mr. Um, Armin Mann in your evidence, um, who's just been appointed. His fit and proper declaration is at eys.001.0002.0002. That's EYS dot double zero double one dot triple zero two dot triple zero two. Now that's a fit and proper de declaration made by him. Yeah. Um, in your evidence, you exhibit the fit and proper questionnaire for each of you and Ms Ma, but for Mr Ma, there doesn't appear to be one. Is there a reason for that? Um, I couldn't give you a, a valid reason for that. No. When that, um, that document itself is one of the steps, is it not, in the process of um, of the committee. Uh, correct. Uh, and 
point one requires him or her to say, I meet the fit and proper standard for the purpose of the relevantly the Act and the regulations. Correct. Um, and the second dot point is my educational technical qualifications, knowledge and skills relevant to the duties and responsibilities of the RSE licensee. Yes. And is it your evidence that in relation to Mr Mann there was separate analysis of that as well? Um, I wouldn't say separate analysis, there was an engagement process because uh, Director Peter Scott would, had moved off the, uh, the board or indicated he'd like to move from the board due to workload issues and uh, we engaged with Peter and through, through his help and through engaging with uh, the employer sponsor we found um, Mr Mann who was a suitable replacement. And can you explain what um, work was done by the committee in relation to that, the committee of which you're a member? Um, well, we directed uh, the CEO to engage with the employer um, association, uh, sorry, with the employer, and to talk to them. We engaged with Director Peter Scott and asked him to, and this was an informal, Peter told me, Peter called me and told me, mate, I've, I'm having trouble meeting my um, obligations to both the, the trustee and to my employer. I'd, I'm just going to advise you that I'd, I'm seeking to um, stand down. So my reaction to that was, well, thanks for being so honest, but can you help us with uh, finding someone suitable to replace you? And he did. He put forward some uh, uh, some ideas, and there was a, a, a consultation process. We asked um, um, our CEO to participate in that and see what um, what came of it. And and. W was um, that individual's skills and qualifications assessed by, by the board? Uh, they were possibly looked at by the, um, the Governance Rem and Nom Committee prior. I'd have to check the timeline, but they would have been accepted by the board, yes. Uh, and Recommended to the board and, and then accepted by the board, if and, they found. And in the course of that, um, in the course of the board considering it were what um, what matters to your recollection were considered as relevant? Well, firstly, the um, uh, the director that he was replacing, so that was of some relevance. Which did they have a similar skill set? Uh, and that was something we were seeking, so that was one point. We also were after someone who had a belief in what we do as an industry super fund, as an equal representation model. We have a very cooperative um, board. We, we get along very well. We have very um, effective processes. So you need someone with that right fit to um, step into, the, into, that, uh, into the, uh, the board that way. And um, lastly, I suppose the, um, uh, you know, the willingness, the readiness to undertake the role. There's also um, a requirement. I'm pretty sure Mr. Mann undertook the um, AIST course prior to joining the board. I'm pretty sure that was the timing. And you've said uh, in relation to that proce um, process that a recommendation is put to the um, put to the board. Now, it was your evidence previously that the board can. Um, reject a nomination. Um, is that right? Uh, on my understanding of the Constitution? Well, the Constitution itself indicated that, uh, you'll recall, at um, Clause 14.5AG, um, which is at page EYS.0001.0015, Um, and you'll see at G, any person may be selected as a member director subject to the superannuation law yep. and any eligibility criteria determined by the directors. Yes. Now, the eligibility criteria determined by the directors, am I right to say that that's what 
is in the board renewal policy and in the fit and proper policy. So are you saying, oh, sorry, okay, I think I know what you're saying. Any eligibility cr uh, criteria determined by the directors, are you asking me, does that refer to the fit yes. and proper? And the, yeah, uh, I believe so. So, previously we are at the fit and proper policy, SW7, which is EYS.005.0001.0029. Yeah. at 0033, and at 8.10 at the bottom it says, if the requirements have not been met, the committee, that I assume is the committee that you refer to, may decide to recommend dot point one, the chair discuss with the sponsoring body, mm -hmm. or two, potential training to address any deficiencies for the nominee to undertake within a, re within a required time. Do you see that? Yes, I do. That doesn't refer to there being a power for the person to be rejected, does it? I think I think it's intended to uh, work with the sponsoring body to find someone suitable. Let's just say hypothetically, well, perhaps I can ask, how many times has the person who's been put forward in the time that you've been I'm on the board. How many times has the nominated person been rejected by the board? Not once. I'm sorry? Not once. And if, to use the Commissioner's language, push came to shove and the union wanted someone appointed, where, or an employer for that matter, wanted a particular person appointed, where is the power to um, reject that for the board? Um. I think you'll probably be you'll probably be engaging with the sponsoring organisation to avoid the situation where push comes to shove. Push comes to shove is never something that we've encountered. We've always had a good relationship with our sponsoring bodies. If someone if someone was as determined to have someone on uh, place as a director who was patently ineligible in our view. That would be a pretty bad situation to be in. We have never been in that situation because we and have also a well. The 147A uh, subpart D may perhaps have some engagement. I'm not sure. And 14.7A on page 13. 14.7A. 14.7 capital A subpart D must not appoint as a director unless, amongst other things, the board has resolved. The person has satisfied the requirements of the fit and proper policy. Mm. We've got to possibly that... say you meet the policy. And can I ask you some further questions about that question of governance and the sort of people who should um, be on the board? Um, or the view of the trustee as to who should be on the board. Um, and you deal with this in your second witness statement, which is um, at paragraph 92, if I could ask that that be called up. And I think you might have gone to the, sec the first statement. It's the second statement in response to rubric 563. You were asked um, of the views and consideration by the licensee uh, in re relation to equal representation on the board. Do you yes. recall being asked about that? Yes. And you referred to 
uh, a letter from APRA in relation to the proposed superannuation legislation amendment trustee governance bill 2015. Correct. And you were on a committee about that, weren't you? Um, I believe Wilson? so. Yes. And do you recall what that proposed legislation, that of course didn't become law, but do you remember what that legislation was about in 2015? Uh, yes, I do. It was about um, legislating a requirement that uh, one third of a board be independent um, of any of the um, other bodies, one third um, employer nominated, one third uh, member nominated. And, uh, and the committee of, you, of which you were a part was asked to form a view on behalf of um, the, the trustee about that bill. Mm. Um, perhaps I can take you to your work on that um, at eys.0001.0024782. Uh, this is a note or a submission to the directors from that committee. Do you recall this document? I do. And did you have a part in putting it together, Mr Wilson? Um, it says that it's from the Chief Executive Officer. Uh, yeah, but it records the view of um, the, the committee. Oh, the, the committee, body. yes, correct. Yeah. And you were part of that? Yes, the, right, correct. I, I can take you to... No, that's no, fine. Uh, and... The committee there said, the, sorry, it's recorded there, the committee is of the view that the bill contains provisions designed to ensure that superannuation funds have the flexibility to select independent directors who have the relevant skill set to aid fund performance. Yes, correct. And which brings governance of regulated superannuation funds in line with international best practice standards. You see that? I do. And the committee notes that, the, that superannuation is a significant asset for Australian households and the very high standard of governance is required to ensure that Australian superannuation is protected into the future. Yes. And this bill will allow superannuation fund boards to draw from a broader pool of independent directors, increasing diversity. Yes. Um, and that was something that you... Um, in. Uh, that, was the, our, that was our view of what the bill was intended by those, those, those drafting it. That was their rationale behind that bill. And was that something that, do I read that though as supporting, as supporting the, the, the proposition that superannuation is a significant asset and that a very high standard of governance is required? Uh, I certainly agree that um, superannuation is uh, a significant asset and a very high standard of Governance is required. Can we just show the whole page, please, without the pop out for the moment? Yes, What's the committee that's being referred to there? Is it the committee of uh, some committee of the trustee, or is it a? a uh, oh, it might be the committee of the of the parliament. Could be. So that is a reference to that committee rather than the committee of which you were a part? Or you don't well recall? Be. It could very well be, yes. I apologise for that. Perhaps if I looked at the minutes, it might help. I might come back to that. But if I... Yeah, I think, I think you're, yeah, it does refer to the the committee in the um, Senate Economics Legislation Committee. So it would be their view. Not what was the view that you had at the time, Mr Wilson? Look, our, the, our, um, our fund never formed a, uh, a formal view. We looked at the, um, the bill. Uh, we looked at what the committee uh, reviewing it had said. Um, you know, there's pros and cons with every uh, change that you make to a, a superannuation fund. I mean, if you have a, a well-functioning fund with equal representation, is there risks attached to changing that? I, I would say there are. There's, there might be some advantages 
um, you might get some diversity of thought, but there could be some disadvantages that would come out of that. So in theory, it's, it's sort of something that's interesting, but uh, in our fund, we, we think we're okay and it's not something that we're prepared to do at this particular point in time. If it became law, we would obviously comply. <laughs> um, but, I mean, the highest, the highest uh, house in the land decided that it wasn't appropriate, so there we are. Now, can I ask you about the funds that you do have under management? Um, am I right to say that there's approximately seven billion fund, dollars of funds that are under management? Uh, yes, there is. Um, and how many members? Um, how many members does Energy Super have? We have approximately forty-eight thousand members. Um, and can you tell me about? Uh, or can you tell the commissioner, please, what has happened to the membership or the size of the membership over the last um, few years? Our membership stayed fairly stable. Um, fluctuated um, minor minor fluctuations in membership stayed remarkably stable I would say so at um, if I can take you to paragraph 38 of your statement first or second the the first statement I'm sorry which yeah. is in response to rubric 504. The, perhaps just leave, stopping there just for a moment. Yes. In the bottom table there, you have the total funds under management. Yes. Which have gone in 30 June 2013, were about four and a half billion. And I think your evidence was it's approximately seven billion. That's obviously because 30 June 2017 was a year ago. Yeah, that's right, correct. Um, if you go to the next page, um, the total number of member accounts. Yes. In, June 2013, it was 48,407. It's now, or at least it might be approximately 48,000 now, but it um, was 47,736, 30th of June 2017. Yes. And can I ask you then to go down a little bit on that page? Mm -hmm. to the operating expenses of the fund at paragraph 41 over the same period of time. Yes. And it's right, though, that even though the membership has slightly dropped or stayed relatively stable, mm -hmm. um, the operating expenses have gone up quite considerably since 2013. Well, they've gone up um, from... Uh 2013, 18 million up to 24 million at uh, 30th of June 17. So by about a third? Uh, perhaps. And then on the next, um, sorry, bear with me. Um, so given that membership has remained, to use your language, relatively stable, the increase in operating expenses have been reflected in a higher administration fee, is that right? Because, yes, it's, it, that's correct, yes. Um, and, and I think you said and that at, at paragraph 127. Sorry, Mr Wilson. Yep. At paragraph, at that paragraph you see a table? Yes. I'm just getting that up. That's on page 25 of the statement, paragraph 127. And the total administration fees um, have gone from $157 to, in that you know, period, to $217? Uh, yes. Is that a matter of, um, of concern to you? No, because it's relative to the growth of the fund. And... The question of, um, of fees or the question of it's fees is... Sorry, it's an asset-based fee. So as the assets increase, obviously the amount is going to increase. So, 
it's not a big concern. One of the things that you've considered over time, am I right, is the possibility of a, um, of a merger? Well, having a, a merged fund, yes, it's been one of the aspects we look at over um, our annual review of our strategy. Um, we've thought about, uh, we look at our competitors and we've thought about mergers, yes. And, well, in fact, your current strategic plan provides for that. If you go, or the business plan, I should say, if you yes. go to SW4EYS.0011.0001.038, <coughs> I think in your, your evidence you say, and this document gives effect to part of it, but the the goals in Energy Super Strategic Plan are to be the leading fund in the energy sector. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, and another is to have strong member satisfaction and retention. Correct. Uh, and if you go to point zero four one six. Um, and you've, uh, this business plan sets out that Energy Super has become a very well respected industry superannuation fund in the marketplace. The top? Yes. Um, and then it, there's an indication the board and management need to ensure continued focus on meeting the needs of members. Yes. And stakeholders. And you set out a number of points. Number one is Energy Super's current risks. Do you see that? At number one, about halfway down the page. I'm sorry. Um, can we blow up number one at about point three of the page? Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, and one of the issues is that, amongst others, um, A, is single industry ties mean we are inextricably attached to the success of that industry in Queensland? Yes, I see that. And membership has been flat for four to five years? Yes. And see, all Australians have accounts, so no flow of new membership as seen in the past. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, D, net cash flow positive but reducing. And E says increasing cost and fee pressures. Correct. And it provides currently in a position of power for merger discussions, reducing as funds amalgamate around us. Correct. What would be one of the benefits of a, a merger? Well, one of the benefits of a merger um, would be to increase the membership, perhaps. It might be that you're looking for a change in demographic. Our, member, our average member is probably around 45 with a very high level of um, funds under management, so balance of about 150 odd thousand. Where if we merged with a fund that had a very low demographic, that would look at our cash flow issue that we're, we're sort of facing. We might also look at a merger in a, a, an industry that we would see as um, having some sort of connection with ours, um, where we'd have commonality of membership, might be uh, one, one thing we'd look at. We might look at a merger to reduce uh, costs associated with administration. Um, we might look at a merger because the larger amount of funds under management could help us to drive down investment fees. There's any number of reasons. It's, it's part of your strategic analysis, I suppose. You look at um, a, a, a potential merger partner and then work out the risks and the benefits and see how you go. And determine, no doubt you'd say, by reference to your general obligations as a trustee? Yes, that would be one of the things you would And obviously that is to act in the best interest of your beneficiaries, ultimately. Yes. And to prefer the interests of the members over um, any other interests? Yes. And you have had some discussions, I put it broadly as discussions, you describe in your statement, you identify some other funds that you've spoken to or had contact with over the last five years or so, yes. six years in relation to mergers. Yes. Um, and you mentioned um, one of the points was scale, that is getting 
more funds under management yes, leads to the benefits of scale. Yes, benefits in terms of then lesser fees and also the ability to perhaps invest differently because one has a, a larger base Correct. of fees. Um, and it's your evidence, as I understand it, that sitting here now, Energy Super is continuously open to merger opportunities. Well, we're not close to them. We're continuously open. I think yes. is the language you yes. used. Um, now, when we went to, when I took you a moment ago to some of those benefits, uh, or as set out in the business plan for 2018-2019, I understand obviously that's what's in, in place at the moment, but have those sort of considerations been in the mind of Energy Super for some time? Yes, that's correct. And indeed, as you've said, you've had some funds with other Sorry, you've had some discussions with other funds in the energy sector? We have. Am I right that there was a, I think it was precipitated by Energy Super, gathered a group of what were described as energy fund alliances together in February 2016? Yes. Um, and that was a meeting of Energy Super itself, NESS Super? Yes. EISS Super New South Wales? Yes. And South Australia and Equip Super? Yes. Um, what was the purpose of that meeting? We, we thought it would be strategic to gather uh, like, like industry funds to have a discussion about our own experience, where we were headed, what we saw as risks in the industry. I mean, our, the energy industry is going through a, a pretty dramatic change, as you'd, you'd be aware. There's um, uh, generators are... Um, changing the way that they operate. We've got introduction of new technologies, so it's a really dynamic sort of area. So we thought that would be a good starting point to talk about those sort of threats to the industry, but also compare um, each other's current circumstances, understand a little bit about each other, explore if there was any possibilities to work together. We might be able to work together in insurance, for example. There could be any number, any number um, of things. Does that group still meet? Do you still meet with...? No, it was a one-off, yeah. Oh. We thought it might um, might turn into something a bit more permanent, but we... It didn't? It didn't, no. Um, in fact, some, what's, one of the other entities there was the Energy Industry Superannuation Scheme Pool, the New South Wales one, is that right? Yes. Um, and is that the entity that you'd had some discussions with, or at least written to in May 2012, about the possibilities of, um, of having discussion or exploratory discussions about a merger? Who was the fund again, sorry? The, well, I, I think it's referred to as EISS, the Energy Industry Superannuation Scheme. Yep. Cool. New South Wales or... That's South, right. Yes, New South Wales. And they, um, they said that no, just that they weren't interested yeah, at the time. that's right. Um, have you had any further discussions with them? Um, I believe we might have contacted Treasury because I, I think they were, a, um, they were still under some state legislation. That's right. So um, I think we may have contacted to see what Treasury was doing, but... No, it hasn't, it hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and you've had, again in 2012, discussions with local government super? Uh, yes, I believe so. And I think it's your evidence that, um, if I'm right, there were three other merger discussions that um, did not develop much beyond some initial work, and that was with Auscoal? Uh, we did. We had some preliminary discussions with Auscoal, yes. Yep. And al the Allied Unions Super Fund? Uh, OSTQ, yeah. Allied Unions Superannuation Trust Queensland. Um, that was a tender process, basically, and we and, uh, weren't successful. And Maritime Super, I think, was the other one that you um, referred to. Maritime, we'd had some initial discussions, um, and we were uh, discussing with them yeah, quite OK, but that was suspended. So I think the most advanced merge proposal over the last few years would be the one with Equip Super, is that right? That's the one that travelled the longest, yes. Um, and when did those discussions commence? Well, Equip Super were a uh, participant in the Alliance Strategy Day. Um, a little while after that, um, in March of uh, that year, uh, one of our directors, David Smith, was at um, CMFS, which is a conference of major superannuation funds, and was approached by some of the directors of Equip, and said that, uh, and this is anecdotal, I suppose, but uh, spoke to Dave about the possibility of 
starting some discussion around possibilities of uh, merger. Well, that was one of the things that was on the table or was the purpose of the Energy Alliance's meeting the month prior, hadn't it? It was one of the things that might have been, yeah. It wasn't the primary purpose, but it was certainly something that could have come out of that, yes. And what happened after that initial, I think it was verb, this verbal discussion? I believe David wrote to um, the board of uh, Equip and then there was some initial conversations about uh, maybe director, sorry, chair and CEO. And there was a, a telephone conversation between our chair, Mark Williamson, and their chair, just to test the waters, I suppose. So Mark Williamson was your predecessor? Yes, he was the chair, yes. Yeah, and, um, and the chairman of Equip Super was Andrew Fairley? Andrew Fairley, yes. And a document was produced, I think, soon after, which went to a board meeting, which I'll come to in a moment, at SW60, that is EYS.0013.0001.0090. Yes. And do you recall this document? Yes, I do. Um, it was presented to um, a board meeting um, on the 31st of May. Um, of 2016. Perhaps I can go to page 0092. And the authors of this paper, who were people, as I understand, members of the executive at both Energy Super and Equip Super, is that right? Correct. And they'd identified a number of benefits from a merger between the two funds? Uh, possible, yeah, possible benefits. Um, Correct. I think it. Uh, following benefits have been identified by the merger, yes. And in fact, some of the, the matters, the type of matters you've already raised, the yep. significant financial benefits from increased scale. Correct. In fact, was the first of them. And then second, I guess along similar lines, increased scale in investments that will result in lower investment fees, which will uh, benefit accumulation members and DB employers. What are DB employers? Uh, defined benefit. And increased massive funds will enable the investment in product and service development to be spread over a broader base. Yes. So a number of um, um, matters were there identified, um, and we'll come back as these appear in some of the later, uh, some of the later documentation as well. But those were positives that if if the merger could be could be consummated, there would have been ver those various benefits. Yeah. And that was presented. Um, to the board, as I indicated already, and perhaps I'll just take you to that board paper at SW47. <coughs> which is EYS.0013.0001.0261. Uh, and you'll see there that uh, you were, of course, at this meeting on the 31st of May as the Deputy Chair. I was. And if one goes to 0266, and you'll see there the update on the Equip Super merger proposal, and it says the the chair and Director Smith spoke to the paper. That's the paper we've just looked at. Yes. Um, and there was a robust discussion regarding proposed board numbers and make up and the minimum requirements it needs to proceed before further discussions are held with Equ Super. Mm -hmm. And a number of things were set out in terms of responding to a proposal. Yes. 50% contribution from the Energy Super Board, discussions around a proposed merger, not a takeover. Board and committee meetings are to be rotated between Brisbane and Melbourne. The CEO is to be filled by Energy Super. Recommend a subcommittee of the respective board to be convened to agree board composition. Yes. And Mr Williamson then wrote a letter, or the chairman, he then wrote a letter 
after that meeting, setting out those matters to his, um, to his, or to the board, I should say, of um, of Equip Super. And you'll see that at eys.0008.0001.1325. And at the second paragraph there, the Energy Super Board were very encouraged by this report, that's a reference to the joint work that had been done, and believe the two funds should continue to discuss and develop the merger opportunity. Yes. And there you set out, amongst other things, a proposal that there be 10 on the board with 50% coming from each fund with Energy Super's contribution being two member representatives nominated from the sponsoring unions, two employer representatives and one independent. Yes. And I think it was your evidence previously that a lot of these discussions occurred between Mr um, Williamson and, and Mr Fairley, is that right? Yeah, prior to this point in time, there had been some initial conversations between um, Mr Williamson and, and Andrew Fairley. Uh, there was also some conversations between David Smith, uh, and because he was based in Melbourne, and Equip as a Victorian fund, so David was conversing with some directors of uh, Equip Super to sound out the, I suppose, the state of play to see what the opportunities were like. Sort of a bit of um, uh, background work, I suppose. And Mr Fairley's response is the next document, EYS.0014.0001.3075. And he there indicates that the Equip Board had subsequently met and is very supportive of continuing to develop this merger. And then on the next page, 3076, he indicates, or he says, as I indicated to you during our meeting with your trustees and your CEO in Brisbane in May, Equip is aspirant to appoint the most highly skilled board of any financial services institution in this country. In order to do that, it undertook a detailed skills matrix process with Hedrick and Struggles in 2014 and implemented some of those findings during 2015. Yes. Um, and skipping over the next paragraph, he said, as a result of this, our board has achieved a strong balance between member employer representation and skills. It is important to the Equip board that there be a commitment from energy to adopt the approach of a skills-based board. This would logically mean that in circumstances where a skills matrix had been established by the merged fund, in the event that persons nominated by the unions or employers did not have necessary skills, as measured by an independent third party consultant with necessary skills, then the board would retain a right not to accept the nomination and request another nomination of individuals that did have the appropriate skills. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and that seems pretty reasonable, doesn't it, as a statement? Well, it seems uh, it's certainly a statement. Um, what, is not, uh, what is not provided is any detail around what that means. Uh, and, and, and it's certainly reasonable to have a skills-based board. We don't disagree. We have a skills-based board. Do you have, as part, of, um, as part of that, an independent third party consultant assessing the skills? Yes, we have our uh, board reviewed every year. That's right, but um, but as part of the uh, as part of the persons nominated by the unions or employers, are they um, measured by an independent third party consultant to see whether they have the necessary skills? Um, no, we as I said earlier, we approach our skills from the collective of the board, and our board is analysed every year as to how our collective skill set is operating. And, and I think. In fairness, I think Mr Fairley then goes on to say a process would need to be developed based on objective criteria. That's right. So we weren't opposed, we just wanted to see what the criteria was. Um, interestingly, we had better performance over those years, so it's arguable that if that's a measure of skill, um, we were interested to see what their skills were. And, and in fact, after receiving that at eys.0008.0001.1, Triple three. Well, perhaps before I get to that, am I right that then after that, the subcommittee was set up called a Project Power Committee? Is that right? Uh, yes. 
And you were a member of that? I was. I think. And Mr Williamson's response to Mr Fairley, which is on uh, the screen now, say, acknowledge that the, the merger had the potential to be in all of the members' best interests and we are keen to progress discussions. Yes. Um, and after that, if I recall correctly, there was actually an MOU signed between, between the parties. Uh, sometime after that. I think it was on the 26th of yeah, July, so just yeah. sort of shortly after that. Yeah, not long after. Commissioner, I just note the time. Yeah, well, can we, uh, given that everybody's come down from Brisbane, how much longer do we need, Mr. Donnelly? About 15 minutes, and I've just oh, asked. I'll go until half past four. I won't go past half past four, but I don't see uh, why people should have to come traipsing back down uh, unless they have to. Let's get on with it. Uh, Commissioner, uh, I shall do just that. If I can go to eys.0008.0003.0428, what's this document? Um, this was a uh, an analysis that we had KPMG undertake. Um, to give us some, I uh, suppose, some data around what up until this point hadn't really been quantified. We wanted to understand from a, an external party with an, uh, an analysis of the two funds to see what could be gained. Um, and if one goes to point 0431, one of the findings, I mean, the document speaks for itself, mm -hmm. but one of the findings is that the high level cost benefits demonstrated opportunity to conservatively provide members and employees annual cost benefits of up to $20.5 million. Uh, yes. And that would lead to um, 15 basis points savings uh, for, for members. Yes. Yep, 10 to 15 basis points was certainly mentioned. And amongst other things that were identified there with the new fund side, sorry, the new fund size will necessitate hardening governance, compliance and risk arrangements uh, and that it would achieve additional scale by engaging with medium and small funds with a proposition that reflects that the new fund is big enough to make a difference but agile enough to work innovatively. Is that something that was said in that report? Yes. Now, that was then considered by the project power, um, that was then considered by the project power committee on the 19th of September 2016. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, can I just tender that document if I may? Exhibit 5.133, KPMG Project Power High Level Assessment, 6 September 16, EYS 0008 0003 0427, Exhibit 5.133. Um, before I go to that committee meeting, though, there was a, an email then, etu.0001.0060. Go down to the bottom of that email. There's a reference to KPMG having completed the high level analysis. Yep. Sorry, I should say this is an email that you wrote to a Mr. Simpson yep. or Simo, yes. but that's Mr. Simpson, and he was one of your fellow directors. 
Yes. Uh, and it said KPMG have completed the high level analysis of the potential murder and merger and the options. I'm still digesting it, but it seems that the benefits touted take some time to flow. Correct. Um, in a reference to a meeting, and it says Mark and I are trying to pull it up, but John and Dave seem to be pushing to get equipped to pull the pin, if at all. What does that mean? Okay, there's a bit of a backstory, I suppose. What it means is that there's mixed messages coming out of the negotiation around a possible merger. We have Mark having conversations with Andrew Fairley. Uh, the initial conversation, as reported back to us by email by Mark, was that um, had a conversation with Andrew Fairley, um, said that a potential killer or deal breaker would be any union nominated positions on a merged board. That was the opening exchange between chairs in what was supposed to be a merger opportunity. So I just wanted to put that on the record that there's a, an exchange between chairs that indicates that they would have trouble with any union appointed directors on a merged fund. It goes further to say that we've worked, on, worked for years to get rid of them off and we're not going to reopen the practice. So I just have to put my, that, uh, that in, in the time frame. So, so regardless sorry. of that, we had Dave Smith in Melbourne talking to directors from Equip who were saying, don't worry about Fairley, that's just him. We're at the board level, we want to progress this. We want to progress with this merger, don't worry about Fairley. So we're getting mixed messages out of Equip. We have maintained, we had maintained our position in that letter from Mark Williamson that we would be seeking a board of 50% Energy Super, 50% equip. So by the time we get to this point in time, we've, uh, the Project Power Committee has um, asked management to get KPMG to report, it comes back. The report comes back with uh, the savings that are identified, so 20 million between, out of $14 billion fund. 20 million is a big number, but when you compare the two funds and the, it's not that big of a deal. Um, Mark and I are trying to pull it up. The reason Mark and I are trying to pull it up is because my feelings were from the very start that this won't get over. This will not proceed because you've got the chair of the other fund saying we will not accept union nominated directors on the fund. Mark and I are trying to pull it up because I didn't want to expend any more money. I didn't want to expend any more of members' money chasing a, a merger opportunity that I thought had been soured from the very start. Now, on the other side, John and Dave seem to be pushing to get equipped to pull the pin, if at all. John and Dave were two other directors on the, um, on the uh, energy board. John uh, was an employer director, Dave was a union director, nominated director. Both had been through the previous merger that we had completed successfully. Both were saying to Mark and I, who hadn't been through a merger, this may not be exactly what it seems. It might be just fairly trying to achieve something. David's also meeting with the directors, so we're getting mixed intel. Is it, perhaps if I can cut to this, ultimately when you had a board meeting after this, is the position that the ETU, or it's recorded in the minutes, the ETU have requested the ETU and QSU be named in the proposed constitution to secure past um, tenure past the first term of appointment, is that right? Correct. And there was then a further board meeting on the 19th of November 2016. And am I right to say in considering the merger, one of the things that you noted is that the members would receive a 15 basis point reduction in fees? Potentially. That, that we would require to, be, to do much more um, deeper analysis. The KPMG report was at a very high level. Uh, to ascertain the full equivalency of a merger would require expenditure that would be significantly more. And in discharging your duties to the members, however, you would have had regard to the benefits and the financial benefits that they would have obtained by way of a merger? Had regard to it, yes. Now, it's around this time that It's around this time that Mr Simpson um, writes to you uh, and the CEO 
and the chairman, um, which is EYS.0004.0001.05, sorry, before I do that, can I tender that document, I'm sorry, the email. Emails to and from Wilson, September 16, ETU, treble zero one, treble zero one, zero three six zero, exhibit five point one three four. Uh, EYS.0004.0001.0501. And Mr Simpson here, there's been some discussion about a dra draft constitution and his concern is, I hold made in the end of the first paragraph, I hold major concerns in respect of their proposal to appoint member directors rather than maintaining a direct election model. Do you see that? Yes. And he said, I've also heard the Victorian employers are really keen on having union type, sorry, are real keen on having union types on their board. Again, this merger is not stacking up from my end, from our end. Yeah, there's a bit of sarcasm evident there. Um, and in fact, and perhaps I can tender that, Email from Simpson, November 16, EYS 0004 0001 0501, Exhibit 5.135. I can then go to etu.0001.0520. And just go to the bottom of that, if I may, which is 52. Three, zero five two three. Um, that's the email. He, this is then forwarded by Mr. Simpson. If one goes to zero five two one, please. It's forwarded to a. Who's Mr. Bailey? Uh, yeah. Yes. Who's he? Uh, he's a um, he, he's a politician. And on the next page, Mr. Simpson says, "I'm unsure if you're across Energy Super's current discussions with Equip Super in Victoria about a possible merger. In any event, it's been going on now for some months." Sorry, I'll just ask for that. Yes. The GOCs that are represented on the board will have a big say in whether or not any merger proceeds. See my comments below. We may need to talk to you about the government's position on this prior to Xmas. I see that. Who are the GOCs that he's referring to? Government-owned corporations. And are they the employer representatives? They're some of the employers. Some of the representatives. Yeah. That's right. Some of our major employers. And were you aware of this email that he'd sent to the minister? Uh, he cc'd it. Uh, I think he forwarded it to me. He did. I think you'll see at the top of 0521 that it was forwarded to you. Yes. I tend to that, Your Honour. Emails Sorry, from please. Simpson, November 16, ETU, 0001, 0001, 0520, Exhibit 5.136. Uh, ETU.0001.0001.0502. I mean, if we go to 0503, you'll see at the bottom there, there's an email to you from Mr Simpson. And it says, the board selection criteria is a big one for us, obviously, as are the appointment of independent directors. Yes. Um, I'll be frank, again, we do not support this merger and the more work that comes out of this process, the more entrenched that view becomes. Yes. I don't know where to go from here, but I'm fast getting to the stage where we do want to kill it once and for all. Yes. Now, that email was forwarded to by Mr Simpson on the previous page, so 0502, to a Stuart Trail. Who's Stuart Trail? Uh, Stuart Trail is a organiser for the Electrical Trades Union. And there's a reference to, I will talk to Bailey down the track about the government knocking this off, but it'd be good to start talking to Ros, et cetera. Do you see that? Yes. It's all off the record stuff, hasn't been announced publicly. My aim is not to have it happen. Do you see that? Yes. Um, Commissioner, can I tender that? Document? Email from Simpson, November 16, 0001, ETU, 
treble zero one, treble zero one, zero five, zero two, exhibit five point one three seven. Now, on the 20th of December at the board meeting, ultimately the directors resolved to accept the recommendation that there be a merger. Yes. Subject to Equip Super amending the constitution to meet Energy Super's needs. Do you recall that? Yes. And had you decided at that point that a merger was in the best interests of members? I had in my mind that the merger would not proceed because of the entrenched opposition of the equipped chair to having any union nominated members on the board. So I didn't think it would proceed. Had you formed the view that it was in the best interest of the members for the merger to proceed? For, the, for it to be in the best interest of the members, the merger had to go through two steps. It had to go through the full ST, uh, successor fund transfer. If we didn't have representation on the board, we wouldn't be assured that it would go through to that full. Who's, who's we? If, the, if Energy Super didn't have representation on a merged board, we could never be sure that it would progress through to the full SFT, as outlined in the KPGM, uh, KPMG report. Was it ever said, was it ever put though by Equip Super that there be no Energy Super directors on the board? No, they were resistant to any union nominated directors on the board. They said that several times through conversations between Andrew Fairley and Mark Williamson. The, the position that uh, was put by Energy Super, uh, I'm sorry, the position that was put by Equip Super was there'd be no automatic rights for QSU and ETU to nominate board positions. Correct. And that Energy Super would have to comply with their, meaning Equip Super's board skills policy to all board appointments. Yes, that was that was. And they were they were they were non-negotiable for Energy Super. I believe we'd, we'd hit a point where there was non-negotiables for us, and there was non-negotiables for them. It, they outlined their non-negotiables back in March, um, as it turned out to be. You accept, though, there might be circumstances where something is in the best interest of members, but might not be in the best interest of the unions. Well, everything that unions do around superannuation, because superannuation is a right, it's a workplace right. It's workers' wages that are foregone for retirement. What do unions do around superannuation? We won it. We won it in the 80s through awards. So superannuation is very, very important to unions. It just so happens, when we talk about superannuation funds, that the interests of unions and the interests of members of the funds are so aligned as to be indistinguishable. It's what we do. We look after members' money. The finance through the accumulation and into retirement. If we can't be guaranteed that an anti-union employer based fund, an anti-union employer based fund is going to uh, allow to have union representation on their board going forward, what's going to happen to our members in far north Queensland? What's going to happen to our members in Cairns, in Townsville? Who's going to service them? Mr Williamson wrote a letter and this will be the last document I take you to, um, wrote a letter on the 21st of December after Equip Super had said, well, we won't make those changes, so the merger will not proceed. And at SW52 EYS.0008.0001.0718, you'll see that he wrote to the directors and said at paragraph, the third paragraph, I'm sorry, that's just coming up, EYS.0008.0001.0718, the third paragraph is, the board unanimously agreed the merger is still in the best interest of our members and have confirmed their commitment to continue with the merger through the process agreed upon. Was that the position that you took at that time? The board agreed, yes. That it I was, was in, of the view. That, that it was in the best interest right, of the yeah, members. The board the board I, my personal view was that it wouldn't go ahead. But the board agreed that the merger would be in the best 
interest of the members, yes. But because the union representation and the compliance with the board skills policy couldn't be secured, the merger didn't proceed? Yes, because he equipped Super decided they would not merge with us under those circumstances. The employers who hold the shares of that fund, held on trust by Andrew Fairley, would not uh, agree to change the constitution. So the equipped super um, trustee, uh, uh, the holding company, all of the shares in the holding company are owned by the employers. During this phase, just prior to this phase, Andrew Fairley was consulting with those stakeholders. There was a consultation process going on. They refused to alter the constitution came back and said, no, it's not going to happen. So we decided that we would still write to them and say, we still think it's in the best uh, which is, uh, in interest of the members. Maybe you could have another chat to the employers. We also offered to have some of our employer uh, employers talk to their major employers because our fund doesn't operate like that. We have a very cooperative fund. Our member, uh, member sponsor organisations, our unions and our employers get along when it comes to members best interests around superannuation. So moving to a fund where you have this completely different setup where the employers hold all the shares in the company and won't alter their constitution to allow the shares to be held by uh, the, the directors on behalf of members, that rings alarm bells. Nothing further. Mr. Nelly, Mr. White, is there anything you wish to raise? Mr McKenna. Nothing from me. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much uh, for attending, uh, Mr Wilson, and uh, we can send you on your way back to Brisbane. Thank you very or much. Or Queensland, at least. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is Brisbane, by the way. Uh, 9.30 on Monday.